<laughs> Hi guys, uh, welcome back. Um, this is day three of our Divinely Nourished um, series of the toxicity that we are living in. Um, so welcome. When you jump on, say hi. If you are watching the replay, hashtag replay, or I have arrived, or whatever thing you like to put down there, and I can come back and have a look and feel and pick up on your vibes as you are watching this. And I look forward to hearing and seeing what you have to say and what you think. So I've just rushed back from the mechanic and have just got my car. So I'm a little bit flustered because uh, I literally just walked in the door and I had to push it back just a few minutes because the car wasn't quite ready, but now it is. So welcome, welcome to this session. Uh, if you're on live with me, say hi, let me know you're here. If you're drinking something, let me know. Hashtag water, hashtag tea, coffee, Milo maybe, who knows. Hi Antoinette, welcome to tonight's session. So tonight is the final in the series of three of The Toxicity, which is kind of the first chapter of my book, uh, Divinely Nourished. And the book, of course, will expand it even more on the course. We're going to go into these types of things. So this is the sort of thing that we'll be doing in the course. It will be sessions like this. And then on a Wednesday night, we're going to have a two hour coaching session where you jump on Zoom live with me and we talk about how you're thinking and feeling and what things are coming up for you. And, you know, there's some coaching that will take place in there to help you kind of move through some of the stuff that's coming up for you. So I want to thank you for sharing this journey with me and coming on board and listening to me as I share all the little bits and pieces around Divinely Nourished. So tonight's session is really about the toxicity of the physical plane. So you may have mentioned me talking about for the last two evenings that we live in a world that's far more toxic than it's ever been before. And as a people, we actually do things that are less beneficial or less detoxing than we used to do before as well. So let me give you an example. 200 years ago, most of the chemical stuff that we have created within our industrialized revolution hasn't, was not actually in existence. There wasn't the food chemicals that are around. There wasn't the science that actually uh, pushed that along. There wasn't the machinery that made us be able to do things that we couldn't do by ourselves or took us a long time to do. Like there was a lot of manual labor in actually making some of those things happen. And so now we have machinery and that has gone much more rapidly. And so the toxicity that we are exposed to in our world right now didn't exist as it does now 200 years ago. It didn't exist 800 years ago. It didn't exist a thousand or 2000 years ago, but now it's readily available to us. Uh, yeah, Antoinette, just go back and watch those two, those two ones already. They're there. They'll be up until the 25th and by the t at the end of the 25th, that's when they'll be coming down and they'll be only available then in the actually divinely nourished group. So like I was saying, we live in a world that's far more toxic than it's ever been before. And we do things that are far less detoxing than we've ever done before. So prior to the industrial age, you know, let's, let's say a thousand years ago. So a thousand years ago, a lot of people would have been doing some manual labor. In order for them to get the food, they would have at least been growing their gardens. They would have had maybe a victory garden or they would have been working in some way, shape or form, mostly outdoors. So they would have had sunshine. They also would have been in contact with the earth. They also didn't necessarily have the running water facilities that we have today. So the food that they're eating actually contained sometimes parts of clay, which is a detoxing tool. It helps to detox us. So we naturally did some of those things that actually helped us to detox, like getting in contact with the soil, bathing in rivers and oceans, swimming in an ocean versus swimming in a chlorinated pool, uh, having access to those things. Because when we didn't have the infrastructure, we lived around the edges or where there was food or where there was resources. And so we had access to all sorts of different things and we would come in contact with that on a regular basis. And th those things like fresh air, sunshine, 
exercise, getting in contact with the earth, earthing, even things like making mud pies and bathing in the ocean help to support detoxification in our bodies. Now we think of today, how often are you bathing in the ocean? How often are you eating food that might still have clay on it? How often are you going outside and actually earthing your body, getting in contact with the soil? How much of your day are you spending inside versus being outside? These are all some of the things to think about when it comes to looking at how we are supporting our detox pathways. Are you walking around trees? Are you walking around an ocean? Are you spending time outside deep breathing and connecting and earthing with the soil? Are you making mud pies? We do far less in our society now naturally to support detoxification. And we have far more toxicity. So when we're looking at the toxicity of the physical world, we're looking at, of course, the household chemicals, the things like the bleaches, the um, dishwashing liquids, the soaps, the perfumes, the makeups, the clothes, the chemicals that we use to make the air smell nice, the shampoo, the conditioner. All of those things are, of course, the toxicity that we experience in the home. But it goes even further than that. It goes into even the furniture that we have, the carpets that we have that are off-gassing, the paints that we're using in our house. And we aren't necessarily consciously choosing these. There are some beautiful products that are now on the market, which is fantastic. And I love to see that we're getting more and more access to some clean, healthy sort of products that are available now. But essentially... We live in this toxic world and it comes with household chemicals. It comes with chemicals that are used in your workforce or your, um, yeah, your work area. I know one of my clients was sharing about how they, especially during COVID, they would have their receptionist would have to go through and spray the office with Glen 20, uh, which is not very good for us. Things like the hand sanitizers aren't very good for us. They're killing our microbiome. And so they are damaging our microbiome, which is leaving us somewhat unprotected. Soap is a much better alternative to that. We have chemicals in in so many areas of our life now, including things like the food we eat. So it's easy to go, oh, I'm eating, you know, fruits and vegetables and meats and, you know, some good dairy. But even some of that has been tainted, like the supermarket meat has, you know, quite often been Uh, it has bacteria that is sprayed on it to keep it looking plump and fresh. Um, You know, the vegetables that you might find in the supermarket, they've lost a lot of their nutrients because they've been traveled for such a long period of time or they've been stored for a long period of time because we've moved away from eating in season and we've moved into that space of eating and expecting food to be available all year round. But then let's say you're, you're bringing in some of those things that aren't in that fresh food section. And you're, you know, eating cereal that is then fortified with things like folic acid or folate, which is then, you know, if you've got something like MTHFR, FR, it's not going to be great for you. And all of those products have got things in them like preservatives, additives, colors, flavors, in order to tantalize your taste buds and make you think that you're eating something beautiful and healthy. When actually... It's mostly made out of the things that are the cheapest of ingredients. So you'll find a lot of things in there like soy lecithin. You'll find soy itself just in a lot of those products. You'll find um, vegetable oil, canola oil, all of which are actually rancid in the body and actually increase inflammatory responses. So they create inflammation in your body. A lot of them have preservatives. They might have things like anti-caking agent. I know for example cheese that's been already been grated has got anti-caking agent in it which for a lot of my clients actually they react to and they didn't know that they did because they didn't think that grated cheese would have to need anything other than just grated cheese in it i know for my family you know we're currently on on gaps and so for us we're really careful about what ingredients are in things that we're actually buying 
And we've even looked at banana chips. And banana chips are not just bananas that are dried. One would think that they would be, but actually they're spraying banana chips with sugar and then they're dehydrating them. And so even the simple things that we think are really innocent, that are going to be fine, sometimes actually aren't. And that is just a representation of the world that we live in. Uh, Antoinette is saying, I've heard that it's good for you, good for you to go outside in the sun with no clothes on every day for 20 minutes. <laughs> but a bit hard with neighbours. Yes, and I actually have a client who does that. She's, you know, gardened her house so that she can actually enjoy going outside nude for and, and having her morning coffee outside. Um, yeah, it's also a bit hard with older children, yes. But you don't have to be completely naked. You can do things like lay outside and read a book for 5 to 10 minutes or 15 minutes and, you know, just roll up your, your top so you're covering most of you. You could go out in your bathing suit. You don't have to be completely butt naked. You can if you want to. Like, I'm not stopping you from doing that. But you don't have to. It's not absolutely necessary. But essentially what I'm trying to get to is that we live in this place that is actually very toxic to us. It's toxic to us from that physical level by the food that we put in, the food that we've been sold as as beneficial to us the amount of times that I have um, clients come in and they go oh I've been told this is really good for us and then when I look at it and I explain to them you know what's actually in that food and how that is processed in the body and what it does to them they're like how do we not know this how do we not know that and it's because of the marketing that's there like it's very clever to try and disguise what what the food is you're eating what's actually in that food what it contains it's designed to trick you and it does a very good job a lot of the time. Along with that, though, we have this culture that, you know, there's a lot of shame in our culture. And some of that shame is, you know, if your kid has got a lunchbox that's different than everybody else's, that they could get picked on and bullied. And I have, unfortunately, you know, got children, not my own children, but clients who have their children picked on and bullied at school because they're eating the most nourishing food on the planet. Like, because they're eating vegetables and meats and fruits and they don't have tiny teddies in their lunchbox they don't have all this extra stuff in their lunchbox they're actually just eating real food and they get picked on and bullied at school for eating real food and it's that real food that's healing their bodies but they have this conflict because they don't want to be picked on at school they don't want to be attacked they don't want to have to be different to everybody else but in order for them to be healthy and to heal their bodies and help their brains think really well, they have to. And so we have this culture that's not set up for thriving, especially when it comes to um, encouraging real food. It's not necessarily set up for thriving. We have all sorts of different things that go into helping us create uh, how we're going to eat, including the culture. So I mentioned this to, I think I, I maybe mentioned it on here, Maybe I did. I'm not sure. Um, but I was mentioning it to someone <laughs> that we have this thing around Christmas, for example. Christmas is coming up and I'm talking with clients at the moment who are like, I really want to get my health on track. I'm actually in physical pain because of my stomach and all of this other stuff. But they're still concerned that it's going to interrupt Christmas and it's not going to be a great Christmas because they're used to Christmas being all about the food. And then it's all about the food. And if you need to eat something different in order for you to be healthy and well, then you're making a fuss. Then you're making a problem. And for a lot of my clients, especially if they've got gut health issues, they've also got issues when it comes to their own personal power as well. Because the gut is the embodiment of our personal power. So if we don't feel we're allowed to have a voice and we're not allowed to stand up for ourselves and our boundaries aren't respected, we're likely also to experience gut issues. And so as we are trying to rebuild that, we want to do the emotional plus the physical work together in order to create the great outcomes. And so for many of them, they're already on the back foot when it comes to being able to stand up for the things that they actually need or ask for the things that they actually need in order to be healthy and well. And then thinking about things like Christmas where you have relatives who don't understand it, they've got no clue on how you're feeling and they think maybe you're making it up or it's all in your head and it has all of those things going on for them. 
thinking about starting something that's going to heal their body before Christmas gets really challenging. And it is one of those things where I absolutely understand. And it might be that you go, well, this is the last Christmas I'm going to do this. I'm not going to do this after this Christmas. Next Christmas, I'm going to have the whole year of actually, you know, really supporting my gut and healing my body and do, focusing on all of that type of stuff. And then if next Christmas comes around, I'm going to be in a much better place to not partake in it or, you know, bring some really delicious food to it so that I've got stuff there that I can eat. There is no shame in doing that. The part that I have a problem with is that people feel like they can't actually do the work that they need, especially when they're in pain. They feel like they actually can't go to Christmas and actually eat the food that's going to be good for them and not partake in the other without feeling like they're offending people that the people in their family will be offended if they don't eat the food that's being served to them on Christmas, that they're upsetting people, that they're ruffling feathers, that they're being a problem. That for me is the part that I have angst with because if your family truly love you, if they truly love you, they should want the best for you. They should want you to be able to enjoy your time without going into a food coma. They should want you to be able to enjoy having time with them without actually then having to take two, three days off because you're in pain and recovering from it. They should want you to have the best. And not only that, it shouldn't matter if it's the food. Like the food shouldn't have to be the focus point for the day. Like for most families, you know, if you ask them, it's about getting together. But is it really about getting together if it has to be about the food, if the food has to be a particular way, if you can't bring your own food? Is it really about the day or is it more about the food? Because ideally, a family that's coming together should be able to sit around a table and eat soup and still have a beautiful time together because they're together. So then that makes me question, is it the food? Is it the coming together? What is it? But are they using the food to distract themselves from the coming together? It's, and I'm not giving you the answer to this. The answer is for you to actually decide for yourself. The answer is for you to figure out for yourself. And it's to dig into those things and start to look at the cultural norms and start to challenge the cultural norms and go, do I want this? Is this something I even want in my life? Do I want to spend a day where I'm, you know, feeding myself all this food that's going to make me sick and take, you know, four weeks to come out? Because when you eat one thing that's not great for you, it actually takes four weeks for it to fully leave your body. For all of the processes and the chemicals that were in that and the biochemical changes that that food has created, it takes a full four weeks for it to finally get to the point where it's left your body and it's no longer interacting with your biochemistry. Is that worth it? It might be for you. Your answer to that might be a resounding yes, absolutely. But it might also be no. And how do you feel about saying no to that? Like, are there some feelings that come up around that? Is there some shame that might come up around that? Is there some toxicity in, you know, the shame or the mind or the, the soul that's coming up for that? Is there some stuff that needs dealing with there? Is there some challenges that you're willing and ready to make? Or you're like, no, I don't need to make that. And you're allowed to choose whatever you want. But no, whatever you choose will most likely have some type of consequences to it. And when I'm talking about the toxicity of the physical world, I'm talking about this too. I'm talking about how we've created a culture that gives children things that are poisonous to them. These things down, I like to break them down to their most fundamental elements. And I'm going to tie this together so you start to see how the toxicity of all these three areas really work together in actually creating the storm, the crap storm that we currently have when it comes to our health. And I'm going to come back and I'm going to look at those comments and I can see Jocelyn's got some good ones there. We have this culture of this treat and reward system 
where if your child is being good, you give them a reward. And we've been trained by our culture, it's been handed down to us, we've just, you know, passed it on, that that reward is something like a lolly. And that lolly is like, I'm passing you and I'm giving you this lolly for being a good child, for being good in the supermarket, for doing your jobs, for doing whatever, I'm really proud of you. That's the message we give on the outside. I'm really proud of you, I love you, all of that. But when they eat that, their biochemistry picks up on all the chemicals and the sugar and their body starts to work on that. And their body immediately knows that this isn't going to be good for it. It knows that it's going to have to detox this out. And so you've got two contrasting messages going on for that child. The message that they're a good person, that you love them, that you want to look after them, but also the message that you're giving them something that's going to make them sick. And that's an internal message. They're not necessarily consciously aware of it, but their subconscious puts that together. And it connects the two of those things. That being good is making you sick. Like we, we get to have poison. So, you know, when you've been good, you eat poison. And I'm, I'm being really, you know, triggery with my language because I want you to be triggered. Or I want you to be confronted, essentially, with it. So that you can start to think about it on an actual, a different level than what you maybe have thought about it before. And so externally, you're being told you're good. Internally, it's this is poison. And so we get our wires crossed. So instead of like, you know, you're being so good, I'm going to give you something really beautiful, like maybe some berries or maybe some um, fruit or something that we don't have very often, like let's make a homemade pie. Uh, I'm going to give you those types of things or even maybe not even food. Maybe the reward is an activity together, spending time together. Instead of that, we give them something that's actually going to be detrimental to their health, where it's breaking down their health, it's lowering their immune system, it's creating blood sugar dysregulation, it's doing all of these things that are not great for their body. And we cross the wires over. So when they think that they're being good, the message is that you need something that's bad for you. And we've connected this thing of comfort food being food that's bad for you. But when you need comfort, that's when you need the most nourishing food. It's when you need to be sitting down with like a soup and a stew because that's what you need because it's easy to digest. It's easy to break down. Your body doesn't have to do a lot to get the nutrients out of it. But instead of giving it the thing that it needs to help it through that, that time when it needs comfort, we give it the opposite. We give it more stress. We give it food that's full of chemicals. We give it sugar that's going to dysregulate the blood. We give it stuff that's going, like, you know, soy in there that's going to play havoc with the hormones. We give it all these things that are actually going to upset the biochemistry of the body and we call it comfort. And so for me, I think about this and I go, is it any wonder that we are so messed up, that we have so many problems when it comes to food, when we have so many things going on in regards to, you know, finding it hard to eat well for our bodies, listening to our messages again, listening to what we've been told is the cultural norm. Is it any wonder that we are self-hatred, that we don't think that we're enough, that we don't think that we're lovable, that we don't think we're worthy? Is it any wonder that that's what's going on for a lot of people? For me, I see it really clearly. I go, actually, I can see that there's this strong connection between I'm giving you these foods that are going to make you feel comfort because that's what we've told you make, makes you comfortable and I'm dysregulating your internal world. Like there's a really big connection there. Like the image that comes to me as I'm thinking about this is like handing a, a child a lolly and saying, I love you so much. Here, have some poison. The messaging gets crossed and the wiring gets crossed. And that's another area of toxicity in our lives. 
And so as we're looking at the, the aspects of what does it take to be divinely nourished, what does it take to be and feel like you are divinely nourished, it is nourishing all the parts of you, nourishing your physical life. So that you're eating food that is amazing for you, that is nourishing for you, that's actually going to support your physiology, which is different for everyone. There is very much some similar principles for most people. But even, you know, from a biochemical point of view, there are some differences. We all need to be, you know, that's why I run hair tests so that we can figure out what that is for you. But it's also the toxicity of the mind. So the music, the thoughts, the processes, the things that we see, the things that we hear, all of that playing into how we think and what messages we get from that. And it's also the toxicity of the soul, where we've been wounded along the way, where our inner child is still grappling to try and be heard, to try and be loved, to try and be seen, and it's still driving the bus of your adult body where it's running the programmings and the patterns that served it as a child to keep it safe, but don't serve you as an adult. And we have this intertwining and this interdancing between the two of them and the three of them. There's this connection between one. So from the point of being divinely nourished, if you have a belief that you're not lovable, you're not worthy, you're not enough, or you're not anything else that you want to add to that, then your subconscious gets to work on creating that. And so it starts to attract you to food that it has been taught is not going to be good for you from a biological point of view. So it might be that you're suddenly hunting out the Tim Tams and you notice that there's 10 different varieties. Not that there is, but you know, you notice that there is a lot of different varieties. And you put all of those varieties in your trolley that day because you're like, I need to taste every single one of these to find out which one I like. And then I might need to do it another three times to again decide which one is my favorite. And it attracts you to the cake and it attracts you to the lollies and it attracts you to all of the things that you've been taught are your comfort foods, but actually damage, break down and destroy your body. Because it started with the thought that you're not enough, you're not worthy, you're not lovable. When actually that is an illusion. You've always been worthy. You've always been lovable. You've always been enough. But we've been fooled by the cultural norms, the tribal cycles that have been handed down to us, the generational wounds, the mother wounds, the father wounds. We've been taught by the mirroring back to us from the world that we're not lovable, that we're not enough, that there's something wrong with us. And as we believe this, we go, okay, I'm going to do a diet. I'm going to, you know, jump on some sort of diet program so that I can lose the weight and I can get control of my body. And you do it for as long as you possibly can. And then suddenly you find, oh, I'm so over this. I can't do it anymore. And you completely rebel against not eating those foods like the chocolate bars and the Tim Tams and the ice cream and the, all the things. And you maybe go and have a feast on these things. And then what you do is you sit back and you're feeling crap about yourself. And you're feeling crap about what you've done. And you tell yourself this story that I am crap. Look what I've done. I've just destroyed this. Oh, well, I might as well go and destroy it some more. And so you might go on an eating binge where you're eating lots and lots and lots more of those types of foods that you know are not good for you. Because you're fulfilling the belief that you have around yourself. You're fulfilling that belief that there is something wrong with you. And you're just proving it. You're just creating evidence. See, look, there's something wrong with me. I can't even stick to a diet. How stupid am I? Whatever names you call yourself, whatever stories you implant in that. And we go around to this swirly, swirly circle of filling our bodies with toxicity, telling ourselves that we're stupid in our mind, listening to music that is bringing us down and condemning us and telling us that there's something wrong with us 
not feeding our souls, not healing the wounds of the past. And the cycle just continues to spiral until you finally get to the point where you go, that's it. This is just my life. I'm not going to try any more diets. I'm not going to try any more things because they don't work. When it was never the diet that didn't work. Most diet plans actually work to some extent. It doesn't mean they're all healthy for you, but they generally work to some extent of helping you lose some weight if you stick to them enough. It's rarely the diet's fault, although I do see some really bad diets on the market. The thing that generally stops people from continuing to follow through is the belief that they're not enough. That the stories that they've been told about who they're allowed to be in the world, how they're allowed to be. And the food quite often is the safe problem. It's much easier for me to just blame everything on food and say, well, it's the food's fault. Like, it's because of this food that I'm this way. And that's just my lot. I'm not going to get any better. It's much easier to do that than go, hang on there's a little person still living inside of me that is still carrying wounds from when she was three or when she was four and this happened to her or that time when dad came home and he was drunk and he slammed the door and he scared you and you were frightened and you felt alone like it's much easier to blame the food and to blame the diet and to blame all of those things than actually to look at the darkness to look at those spots that need healing those wounds that need to be loved, where you need to shine the light on and actually bring some love and peace and restoration to. It's so much easier to just blame it on the food and blame it on a diet and blame it on my willpower that doesn't work than look at the wounds that really need healing. And that's where we reach this space of being truly divinely nourished. When we're able to nourish those wounds and bring love and peace and joy and compassion and hope to that little one that's still living inside. When we're able to fill our energetic space with positivity and things that are going to uplift us and keep us walking in the direction that we want to go. Where we communicate with people on a regular basis that are doing the same thing, that are wanting to rise up other people, wanting to lift other people up. When we're listening to music that's encouraging us and empowering us and shaping us and guiding us. When we're nourishing our bodies with food that's really, really good for us, that is literally the best food on the planet, that's when we are really in divine nourishment. That's when we become that clean vessel being able to communicate and connect with the power that's greater than us freely. We can connect with that power anytime we like, but sometimes we mess up the mud. We stir it up by having all this other stuff going on inside of us. And that's where we can actually clear the channels and we can hear the voice that's calling us and we can connect and we can do beautiful things in the world where we can lift other people up. We can encourage them. We can, you know, Share that journey of rising other people up and we get to that place where we have a world that's full of love and compassion and people who are healed. That's where we reach that divinely nourished space where we nourish ourselves fully and completely in all the parts of ourselves. And we can do that for then for other people. We can show them the way. We can tell them, what did I do? We can guide them. We can do it for the world over. That's when we're divinely nourished. And that's the work for me. That's the work of the divinely nourished. It is to look at those dark spots. Look at the things that we have been deleting and distorting and generalizing in our life. To actually shine a torch on them and to look at them. And to see them for what they are. And question, is this what I actually want? Or do I want something different? Am I happy with how this is going? Or do I want it to be different? That's the work of what Divinely Nourished is. Let me know. Is this resonating for you? Put it into the comments. (laughs) 
Antoinette is saying that is not that's good that it's not absolutely necessary to be naked outside. She feels much more comfortable with that. Uh, Jocelyn is saying that they started Gap's intro two weeks before Christmas, which is like probably one of the most restrictive parts of the diet, Gap's intro, uh, and and doing it with Christmas. There is always a way. If there is a will, there is always a way to make this happen. Uh, she's saying that I would have found it so much harder if we'd done it while we were still at home. Yeah, and that makes me kind of sad. Like it makes me kind of sad that you would have found it much harder to do while you're at home because it, that, that then kind of tells me that maybe the people that are around you wouldn't have been fully supporting you in your healing, which is kind of sad. Antoinette is saying, I find it hard going out to family, etc. sometimes. And yes, they might think that it's all in my head, but I bring things I need and I like to be respected for that. And I will just stay home or be happy on my own. Yeah. And, you know, we're the crazy people that generally take food to food wherever we go as well. But people who love you and care for you respect that. They know it's not about them. They know it's about you getting the healing that you need versus it being about anything else. So I want to thank you for joining me tonight for this final session in this trio. This is the work of the Divinely Nourished. It is to connect into all of the stories, all the things that have you know, brought us to the place that we are, to look at how our biochemistry makes us think differently, to look at how us thinking differently alters our biochemistry, and then that alters the desires and our um, what we actually see in our senses to bring into our bodies. You know, if you're in a space of self-hatred, you're going to see more things that are going to be not so great for your body. But if you're in a place of like fully loving your body and loving yourself for who you are and respecting it, you're not available to bring junk into it. You recognize that you're a Ferrari and Ferraris require top quality petrol. They get great services. They, you don't go and buy one of those expensive cars and then don't look after it. That's generally not what most people do. Most people are looking after those cars, but we in our bodies, are, like our bodies are so much more than a car. Our hearts and our spirits are so much more than a car, but often we don't do the same level of it. We don't give the same level of attention to that, which kind of is like really sad. The other thing that I want to say <clears throat> And this was something that's, that came out for me in my own journaling on a lot of this topic and digging into it and figuring it all out and kind of just like really delving into what does this really mean. And one of them was that I knew that I was destined for great stuff. And I see it in my clients all the time, especially when they come to me because they they've want to deal with weight. They they say things and they, you know, communicate to me and I can hear in their voices that actually they're destined for great things. They've always been destined for big things. They've been called to amazing things. And they're not stepping up into those things because of fear, because of social conditioning, because of all of those things that, you know, stop us from stepping up. And because they're not stepping into their greatness on the outside of their bodies, they step into greatness on the inside of their bodies and they expand their bodies in order to hold the energy that they're not releasing, that they're not letting out, that they're not sharing, that they're not giving away. In order to hold that, they create bigness within their bodies, which then makes them attracted to the food that's not going to be great for them, that makes them attracted to the cycles that are not going to support them, that makes them bring in products into their home that they know are not going to be great, but they're easy to use. It leads them to do all of those things. And so when you're thinking about this, whether you join me for Divinely Nourished or not, think about what are the things that come into play for me when it comes to what's going on for my body, whether it be eating healthy and well because you're, you've got IBS, whether it be, you know, I'm reasonably healthy, but I know that I have, could have more energy and I'm not really giving myself the opportunity to have all the energy that I could have. Whether it be you have some serious health conditions that you actually need to work on. 
I can hear someone crying outside my door. It's okay, somebody's got them. Question those things. Start to look at your life and go, what are the social norms that I'm conforming to? Uh, am I happy with them? And you're allowed to be happy with them. You're allowed to go, yes, I'm happy with this. I'm going to keep this exactly the way that it is. You're also allowed to go, no, I'm not happy with that. I'm going to make a change. I'm going to think about how I could do this differently. And it doesn't have to be today you see the problem and tomorrow you don't, you like never do that thing again. It can be today you see the problem. And then as you journey along, you start to see the solutions to that problem and how you might be able to do the same thing or in, interact in the same way, but do it in a way that's actually healthy for all versus it damaging your body and bringing you down. Jocelyn saying yes and so glad we did. Even when we did, it was so much easier than I thought. That's the having having intro over Christmas, especially over Christmas. The kids were amazing. The results were so worth it. And we even had some wonderful family members that are super supportive and inclusive and understanding. And that's really beautiful. That's really beautiful, Jocelyn, that you had some family members that were really inclusive uh, and, you know, did that for you. All right. That's it for me tonight, guys. I've got a got another call to jump onto. Uh, I want to want to invite you to come and enjoy come and <laughs> enjoy this, but also come and join me for Divinely Nourished. We're starting on the 25th of November, so still the, there's still time to jump in and we're going to be kicking off with some classes and then we're going to be doing some live coaching every week. So 12 weeks, you and me uh, and a group of amazing women. We've already got some fantastic ones in there that I'm already excited to be working with. You and me, a bunch of amazing women going on this journey together as we unpack and we connect with our inner stories and our inner selves. And we do the work of the divinely nourished. All right. Bye for now. And I will catch you next time. We've got another event. So make sure you've liked the event. We're going to be talking about all sorts of other things there. Bye for now. See you later.